Welcome online viewers. My name is Terence Maloon. This is the second in a series of lectures, the 50 years that changed painting, uh, which has been uh, sponsored by the Drill Hall Gallery at the Australian National University. Our sincere thanks to Andrew Dyer and Donna Marie Kelly, who have generously sponsored this series of lectures and its transfer online. Henri Fantin Latour began work on this painting shortly after Eugène Delacroix's death was announced on the 13th of August, 1863. Over several months, he assembled a group of friends and acquaintances, some of whom had solid ties to Delacroix. Others were more tenuously associated. This group portrait was exhibited in Paris in the Salon of 1864 under the title Homage to Delacroix. These days we'd be hard pressed to identify any radical or revolutionary intentions in this painting, its sober realism, its somber palette of blacks, browns, and warm greys lifted by gold, its deliberate antiquarianism harking back to the group portraits of men in guilds or company groupings, the assemblies of proud Burgers painted by Rembrandt, Franz Hals, and their contemporaries in 17th century Holland. None of those aspects would appear to link this painting to modern art, and especially not to the eventuation of abstract painting some 50 years later. But such impressions can be misleading, and in this instance, they're very much so. Seated on the left, holding a palette, a palette which, legend has it, Delacroix actually gave to him, Henri Fantin Latour has portrayed himself with flowing hair, working, wearing an open neck shirt with voluminous sleeves, in contrast to the buttoned up formality of the others in the picture. His appearance harks back to the fashions of 1830, to a revolutionary era in France and the heyday of the Romantic movement. It was in 1830 that Delacroix painted Liberty Leading the People, a painting which shows us literally the vanguard of a popular uprising storming the barricades. This idea of a vanguard was appropriated by social philosophers and cultural uh, theorists, uh, initiated, we think, by the anarchist philosopher Saint-Simon in the 1820s. 1825 is the date usually cited for the first appearance of the term avant-garde used in uh, a figurative sense. Fantin's painting shows artists and intellectuals of the avant-garde. Delacroix's proselytes categorized him in just this way, and many of them adopted the term for, for themselves. Delacroix's hagiographer, Théophile Sylvestre, for example, concluded the preface of a publication on Delacroix that came out the same year that Fantin Latour's painting was shown in the Salon, saying, Eugène Delacroix is at last confirmed as the, greater, as the greatest painter of his era, according to the belated estimation of the connoisseurs. We enthusiasts of the avant-garde 
can rejoice in this fact. We enthusiasts of the avant-garde. Fantin's group portrait is a gathering of like-minded proto-modernists, and we should be clear about what brings them together here. Two individuals in the group are of especial significance. To the left of the framed portrait of Delacroix stands James Abbott McNeil Whistler, and to the right of the portrait stands the auburn-haired Edouard Manet. In the Salon des Refusés of that year, Whistler and Manet were both branded revolutionaries and martyrs. Whistler for his painting The White Girl, Manet for his painting Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe. Some further information about the Salon exhibitions and the Salon des Refusés in particular uh, will be necessary to clarify the reasons why Manet's and Whistler's paintings created such a ruckus. The official Salon exhibitions were spectacular affairs. In 1863, there were 2,217 works in the official Salon retained from a submission of more than 5,000 works. Having more than 2,000 works in one exhibition is almost inconceivable for us today, when a hundred or less than a hundred is already considered a lot to look at. But just imagine that there were an additional 2,700 works that were rejected and it was from these that the Salon des Refusés, uh, an equivalently massive showing, was constituted. And just to be clear, once your work had been rejected, participation in the Salon des Refusés was not mandatory. In 18... 63, there had been such an outcry against the number of works rejected, uh, attacking the manifest bias of the selection committee, who consisted of academicians, that the Emperor Na Napoleon III was drawn into the controversy. Setting up an exhibition of the rejected works was his idea. The public could judge for themselves the fairness and rectitude of the academ academicians in the vetting committee. What was revealed by the exhibition of rejected works <clears throat> was not simply evidence of the selector's bias, it revealed a gulf that had opened up between the official salon with its academic criteria and alternative independent approaches to art that were pointedly anti-academic. The critic Jules-Antoine Castagnari proclaimed that a new school had been revealed by the Salon des Refusés, a school he called naturalist. That's a portrait of Castagnari on the left, painted by Courbet, and on the right, an early self-portrait by Whistler. You'll grasp just how much Whistler's early work was influenced by Courbet. On the right, uh, the brochure for uh, the Salon des Refusés. On, on the, there, we have no photographs of the installation of the Salon des Refusés, but uh, there on the left, uh, some works installed in the official Salon of 1864. The Salon des Refusés was an important rallying point for our purposes uh, because of the identification of naturalism as an unsanctioned independent current 
in 19th century art. The 50 years that changed painting, which is the saga our lecture series is tracing, uh, examines the mutation or the progression or the degeneration, depending on the way you wish to see it, from the triumph of naturalism in the 1860s to the triumph of abstraction in the 1910s. So, in effect, our story begins here. One of the things that characterized naturalism was its rejection of an elevated style, which is to say a classical or neoclassical affectation, a preoccupation with the ideal, the timeless, the epic, the antiquarian, the rhetorical, the authority of a very narrowly defined tradition. Daumier's 1855 cartoon showing the combat between realism and idealism pits the feisty journeyman from the provinces, he's wearing clogs, against a disdainful professor of the Beaux-Arts. The battle in aesthetics is shown as a confrontation of social classes, of clashing class perspectives. But the situation assessed by Jules Antoine Castagnari 10 years later had significantly shifted. And the class perspective of naturalism, as opposed to the earlier manifestations of realism typified by the paintings of Courbet and the paintings of the barbers in school, was certainly no longer the perspective of proletarians, provincials, and journeymen. The naturalist artists were staunchly urbane, middle class. They were proud Parisians. They thought of themselves as distinctively modern people. Modernity, la modernité, was a word possibly coined by Charles Baudelaire, given great emphasis in a famous essay, The Painter of Modern Life, published in 1863, that is, in the very same year that Fantin Latour painted his homage to Eugène Delacroix, in the same year that the Salon des Refusés took place, and in the same year that the name naturalism was applied to the emerging school of anti-academic French painters. How did Baudelaire define modernity? In his own words, modernity is transitoriness, the fugitive, the contingent. And yet for Baudelaire, it could never constitute the whole of art. It had to be reconciled with ideality, in his words, with the eternal and immutable. The duality that people of the time recognized between the real and the ideal, which could otherwise be categorized as between the concrete and the abstract, was already being shot through with ambivalence, contradiction, and completely novel ways of thinking, uh, as we shall presently discover. The sacred monster of reaction in the French Academy was, of course, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres. His famous productions, like the Apotheosis of Homer, here, and his great skills as a draftsman, were the epitome of academic excellence. Whistler, Manet, Degas, Fantin Latour, 
and other painters of their generation had all received instruction, had all been taught, and had had, had their work routinely criticized by academic masters. Manet and Whistler studied with famous academicians, Manet with Thomas Couture for six years between 1850 and 1856. Whistler more fleetingly had uh, attended the atelier of Charles Glaire. Thomas Couture won a gold medal for this painting, Romans of the Decadence, in the Salon of 1847. It's a huge canvas. You can see it in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Uh, Couture was Edouard Manet's master. Fantin Latour and Pouvy de Chavannes were also his pupils. And this is Charles Glaire's uh, most famous work, Dance of the Bachant, uh, shown in the Salon of 1849. Whistler was associated with Glaire's atelier, as were Monet, Renoir, and Sisley. Any notion of modernity, of the transitory, the fugitive, the contingent aspects of contemporary reality has been entirely expurgated from these works, of course, which are nonetheless full of quotations and allusions to Renaissance painting and Greco-Roman art and our fully coherent imaginary worlds, inviting viewers into the fantasy lavishly rewarding the voyeur with abundant female nudity and erotic innuendo, which a neoclassical alibi has made not just seemly, but honorable, worthy of a gold medal, in fact. And so the shocking dissonance generated by works such as these, representing what Castagnari called naturalism, may begin to be understood in its raw and savage challenge. On the left, another contentious manifesto painting by Henri Fantin Latour called a studio in the Batignolles, exhibited in the Salon of 1870. And it is a show of solidarity for Edouard Manet, shown seated at his easel, surrounded by admirers. One such admirer is the novelist Emile Zola, leading light of literary naturalism, the term had by now become widespread in its application, Zola being the chief defender of Edouard Manet in his published art criticism. In gratitude, Manet painted this great portrait of Zola on the right, exhibited in the Salon of 1868. Both of these works are, as it were, manifesto paintings of the new naturalist aesthetic of the emergent modernism that was starting to gain some brilliant adherence. Zola was a superb advocate, but you'd also have to call him uh, a, a plucky publicist and booster. And in the fateful year of 1867, he published a pamphlet entitled A New Manner of Painting. Edouard Manet. The blue cover of the pamphlet can be seen on the desk behind the quill pen in the portrait where Manet, printed on the cover, also functions as the artist's signature. 
In the pamphlet, Zola poked fun at the prevalent ideas of painting, enshrined in the academy and ingrained in the minds of the educated public. Here is the crowd's idea of art, of painting in particular, he wrote. There is an absolute beauty existing beyond the artist, or to express it better, an ideal perfection towards which everyone aspires and which everyone attains, more or less. Thus there is a common measure, which is beauty itself. This common measure is applicable to every work produced and according to how much the work approaches or strays away from the common measure. One declares that the work has more or less merit. Circumstances have determined that the standard chosen is Greek beauty, and that the judgments brought to all works of art created by all humanity result from the greater or lesser resemblance of these works to Greek works. Yes, well, that sounds pretty crazy. But if you remove the mocking, satirical tone that Zola imposes, this could very well be a recommendation coming from the lips of Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres himself. It is pretty much exactly what he and his legion of academic followers held as their creed. Charles Glaire, who taught Whistler, Monet, and Renoir, told his pupils, I want you to remember that when one draws a figure, one should always think of the antique. Nature is all right as an element of study, but it offers no interest. Style, you see, is everything. So to summarize this creed for you, the ideal, ideal beauty, le beau ideal, is constituted from antique formulae, antique paradigms, formulae of proportion, geometric figures, the triangle, the circle, and the square, the golden section, platonic forms, uh, Pythagoras, Polycletus, Vitruvius, graceful drapery, Eurythmy, the harmony of the spheres, blah, blah, blah. That is what constitutes the ideal, and style is obtained through emulation of ancient models. And so a dichotomy was set up between reality and ideality, the ideal and nature, and the emerging tendency, Courbet's realism, Whistler, Manet, and Fantin Latour's naturalism were understood to be contentious and antagonistic in relation to the ideology of the French Academy. Unwittingly, by showing the works that had been rejected by the Academy's vetting committee in 1863, a schism was exposed, which had the catastrophic effect of undermining the authority of the academicians by sheer weight of numbers, as well as by the considerable abilities shown by many of the artists who had had their works excluded from the official salon. In Zola's articles in praise of Manet, there are many provocative statements, some of which uh, have over time uh, entirely lost their force of contestation and their ability to raise people's hackles. 
For example, Zola quotes Manet saying, I can't do anything without referring to nature. I don't know how to invent. If I do anything worthwhile, I owe it to exact interpretation and faithful analysis. For an acad academician, that would be an admission of complete nullity, complete and utter failure. The ideal relates to invention and the imagination. Manet declares he has no imagination, no power of invention. His painting consists of the transliteration, the interpretation, and the organization of things he has before his eyes. Another wildly subversive idea of Zola's, uh, which gets attributed to the artists he supports, is his belief in originality. A powerful artist has an original way of seeing. His or her originality consists in the coherence, the integrity, and the consistency of vision that he or she communicates to viewers. And finally, the disavowal of le beau ideal of ideal beauty. For Zola, there's no such thing. It's sheer superstition. Which is not to say that there's no beauty, only that it is indefinable, only that it is entirely subjective, relative, and manifold. Quote, We should forget the ideas of perfection and the absolute. We should not believe something is beautiful because it is perfect according to certain physical and metaphysical conventions. Something is beautiful because it's alive because it's human. Consciousness of the relativity, the variety of beautiful phenomena, and a far less limited and less prescriptive notion of what human means inform these manifesto paintings by Fantin Latour and by Manet. What is Manet painting in the work on the left? Is it a portrait of the seated gentleman wearing a very black, a pitch black suit with his white, dazzlingly white shirt cuff catching the light? Or is he watching Manet paint a still life, the still life objects to the left of the picture, presumably a Greek statuette of Athena, plus two vases? oriental vases, probably Japanese. Still life, the art of arrangement, the art of materialism, the art of diligent observation is the paradigm of the new school of artists. As Zola wrote in his pamphlet on Manet, Manet treats his figure compositions like other artists treat still lives. That's what Zola actually wrote. Indeed, uh, Manet's portrait of Zola is magnificently arranged. Here too, the pitch, pitch black of Zola's jacket and the uh, jarring contrast of the dazzlingly white shirt cuff and the open book. Plus, uh, there is the arrangement of pamphlets in a fan, plus the evidence of connoisseurship. Very unusual, very cutting-edge connoisseurship. A gilded screen from Japan, a Japanese woodblock print of an actor, an engraving of a painting by Velasquez, which Manet had recently seen on a trip to Spain, Velasquez being 
uh, along with Goya, an artist who painted in black in a very distinctive way, who used black not merely as a tone, but as a color, who used black not just as darkness and distance, but as a light-loving substance and ally of solidity. Black was also the color of mourning, of course, and Baudelaire, in 1846, had singled out black as the emblemat emblematic color of his era, symbolizing the leveling effect of democracy, since uh, black was worn everywhere, by men especially, men of every social class. The great colorists, he wrote, show how to create color with a black suit, a white tie against a gray background. And that's something Whistler was able to do to perfection, of course. There's also a photograph of Manet's painting uh, Olympia, Olympia in the French pronunciation, which Emil Zola had valiantly defended in the, uh, the press uh, two years earlier when it was shown in the 1865 Salon in Paris. The currency of photography, the importance it had begun to assume, the intense curiosity that some artists demonstrated in regard to the impartiality and the accidental effects captured in photographs suggested novel approaches in composing paintings. This was very much a defining feature of avant-garde painting in the 1860s. And I'll run through some examples before we come to settle on Whistler. I know this has been a very long preamble, but we're getting there. This is Degas' early masterpiece, the Bellelli family, painted in 1862 and shown in the Salon of 1867, where it was badly placed and seems to have been entirely overlooked by the art critics. Treating a figure composition like a still life, the intense formality, the role played by internal framing, the flattening of shapes, the alignment of planes so that they echo the pictorial surface, the pictures within pictures. Given the benefit of hindsight, these might appear to us as the result of an emerging consciousness of the abstract logic of composition, which is married perfectly here to the artist's naturalistic approach. Degas famously said, Fantin, Whistler, and I were all on the same road when we started out, the road from Holland. What he meant, of course, was that they were all interested in Dutch genre painting, in the portrayals of perfectly ordered domestic interiors painted by artists such as Peter de Hoog, Vermeer, Gabriel Metsu in 17th century Holland. Dutch painting had been rehabilitated, so to speak, in France by a most remarkable character. And that was an art historian, art critic, journalist and publisher of a militantly social, socialist uh, and Republican persuasion. His name was uh, Théophile Torre, also known by uh, the names of Théophile Torre Bourger or Bourger, uh, Willem Bourger, 
and uh, Teofil Burga Torre. It is uh, to Torre that we owe the rediscovery of Vermeer, a well-nigh forgotten artist at that point, and the re-estimation of artists such as Franz Hals, Peter de Hoog, and others. Torre's publications chimed in with the sea change taking place in French painting, and as a critic, he was notably friendly towards Delacroix and Courbet, and in his review of the Salon des Refusés in 1863, he responded affirmatively to the resurgence of naturalism and was kind and complimentary towards Manet and Whistler. Conversely, Torre's art historical publications prompted artists to visit Dutch museums. Manet went to Holland in 1863. Whistler set out from Paris in 1858, heading for Amsterdam, but ran out of money midway and had to turn back before he reached his destination. But the circulation of photographic images of Dutch paintings was also doing its work. The affinities and overlaps we've been considering between the works of Manet, Whistler, Degas, and Fantin Latour was due to similarity of attitude and to the convergence of the same or very similar influences. Just to summarize what these were, let's take a pause here to recap. These were artists resolutely anti-academic. Anti they rejected the idea of an elevated style and elevated subject matter. In fact, they threw the whole question of subject matter into doubt. They rejected storytelling. They shunned rhetoric. They disavowed imagination and ideas in the accepted understanding of those terms. They were naturalists. They were resolutely painters of modern life. All of them were influenced by Dutch genre painting. All of them were enthralled by the Spanish painters Velasquez and Goya. They were keenly interested in photography and particularly in its accidental effects. They were all caught up in a craze for collecting Japanese woodblock prints and decorative art from Japan and China. All of this went into the collective mix. And here, Whistler is at a decisive turning point. The work on the right, extremely close to the paintings of Fantin Latour, the work on the left, begging comparison with Manet and Degas. But from its early date and the stunning ingenuity and unexpectedness of its composition, we realize this is an image conveyed by someone with a truly original way of seeing. James Abbott McNeil Whistler was born in the United States in 1834. His father was an engineer in the American Army and was given the job of overseeing the construction of the railway line between Moscow and St. Petersburg. And so James grew up in St. Petersburg, later attending boarding school in Bristol in England. He spent the greater part of his adult life living in London and Paris. Whistler benefited from a polyglot education, fluent in French, German, and later Italian. This 
cosmopolitanism went hand in hand with certain libertarian ideas about modernity. And we learn from Whistler's biographers that as soon as Whistler arrived in Paris in 1855, he became acquainted with a sizable community of Irish dissidents in exile. Thus, we realize that the burgeoning cosmopolitanism of Paris in the mid-19th century was due in no small part to the fact that France offered asylum to refugees from illiberal countries, to free thinkers, to political exiles, and even to subversives. In or around March 1867, Whistler renamed some of his early paintings, giving them titles that alluded to music. The White Girl was retrospectively retitled Symphony in White No. 1. But this painting here, uh, which may be a little larger than you imagine, it's 51 centimeters in height by 77 centimeters wide. That is 20 inches by 30 inches. Hence, uh, a fairly imposing easel painting. This is usually thought to be the first of Whistler's paintings to receive a musical title. And you'll notice that he's inscribed the title in emphatic dark letters along the lower left margin of the picture. We've referred to manifesto paintings, paintings that spell out their affiliations in order to substantiate a new or novel or contentious aesthetic standpoint. And Whistler's paintings are consistently didactic in this respect. So here are Symphony in White number one and number two, the earliest painted in 1861 to two, the second in 1864 to five, the third in 1865 to seven. The, the changes in his approach in representing the figure are important to grasp. As you probably realized, Whistler's model is the same in all three pictures. Uh, it is his girlfriend, Joanna Hiffenden, who was a professional artist model he'd met in London in 1860. In iteration number one, she's a solitary figure in a highly contrived setting. The dichotomy between figure and setting, figure and ground, is pronounced. Whereas in versions two and three, Whistler is at pains to reduce or to minimize the separation between figure, the figure or the figures and their setting. When he painted version one, Whistler was associating with the pre-Raphaelite painters in London. He was friends with Rossetti and Joanna with her startlingly red hair and luminous complexion joins ranks with those dreamy, melancholic, romantic pre-Raphaelite beauties whom uh, Rossetti and uh, his friends called Stunners. The seductive perfume of pre Raphaelitism and the relative transparency of the illusion Whistler has created indulges the viewer with the opportunity for voyeuristic fantasy. The enigmatic, enigmatic title, The White Girl, gives nothing away. But what do we make of the 
disturbing leer of the wolf's head. Uh, the model is standing on a wolfskin rug, and of the flowers she has dropped. That red hair, does it connote blood, the dropped flowers? What idea are they intended to convey? Uh, what does this work signify? Is it lost virginity, lost innocence, the morning after? Whistler has no way of precluding these surmises and the angry, resentful, and mistrustful reception of the painting was due in large part to the sexual inferences, to people's projection of smutty ideas. Whistler may have protested that my painting simply represents a girl dressed in white, standing in front of a white curtain, but who would believe that it was intended to be no more than this. In iteration two, the figure is uh, seen more closely, the figure is partial, and it's more tightly bound into the rectangular canvas, uh, seen more as a whole. This is a painting about contemplation which is offered to contemplation. And the visible brushstrokes of her dress, white on white, streaked, ruffled, are exquisite. Just as the setting presents itself as a model of refinement, elegance, and discernment. Segue to Symphony in White number three, where there is a great change in Whistler's approach. The placement of the figures is quite eccentric. The composition is decentered, so to speak, and the generally pale tonality, no dark light contrast to speak of, the interplay of shapes and the minimum of shading and minimum of modulation of the colors announces a tremendous shift from the style of the previous paintings. Symphony in White number three is very much a manifesto work of the kind we've seen before. It mingles Japanese and Chinese, Spanish, that is to say Velasquez, French, that is to say, Hubei and Manet, English, that is to say, pre-Raphaelite, and ancient Greek influences. In other words, it typifies the eclecticism, the relativism and cosmopolitanism, which had become such an exhilarating feature of modernity for artists living in capital cities like London and Paris. I mentioned ancient Greek influences. These were real in Whistler's case, but the Greek art he loved and responded to wasn't the Greek art the academicians wanted to emulate. It was terracotta figures like these, made in molds, produced in multiples. He was charmed by their simplicity and grace. They called Tanagra figures, so-called after the place in Greece where they were manufactured. The very idiosyncratic placement of the figures here, orienting them to the sides and corners of the canvas, uh, runs counter to everything we've seen before and has the disconcerting effect of making us see the spaces and the shapes between and around the figures as equivalently present and weighty. They're no longer subsidiary or blank or recessive. They're actually uh, active and 
integral to the composition. Any illusionism of the picture, any transparency is uh, deliberately disturbed by these strategies. Deliberately refuting the transparency of painting has become a matter of principle for Whistler. He insists that you see the artifice, the painting's materiality, that you acknowledge it as a plain surface with its tones and colors arranged in a certain order. Whistler continued giving his paintings musical titles or titles that suggested uh, analogies with music, and this is one, one of them. He called it Harmony in Gold and Black. To his contemporaries, of course, this would have been an outrageously minimal, sketchy, abbreviated image, not really fit to be shown in public, a mere sketch, not fit to be considered a legitimate painting. But Whistler was nothing if not a provocateur. Here's what the French critic Théophile Duré wrote in a monograph on Whistler that came out in 1904, one year after Whistler's death. Whistler asserted as the fundamental basis of the art of painting combinations and arrangements of color. The beauty of his materials, the value of the painted substance, the charm of extracting essential qualities from the association of colors so that the work was genuinely artistic by adopting and applying such ideas placed Whistler in an isolated position, which was judged to be inferior. His aesthetic, based on investigations and addressed to qualities which were held to be purely material, struck people as futile and contemptible. The vast majority of English folk, Whistler said, cannot and will not consider a picture as a picture, apart from any story which it may be supposed to tell. My picture of a harmony of grey and gold, which is the work we see here, is an illustration of my meaning. A snow scene with a single black figure, and a lighted tavern. I care nothing for the past, present, or future of the black figure placed there because black was wanted in that spot. All I know is that the combination of grey and gold is the basis of the picture. Now this is precisely what my friends cannot grasp. Black was wanted on that spot, but to call this black spot a figure, if you look at it closely, greatly compounds the outrage. It's not a figure at all. It's a stroke of runny paint, and the legs and feet uh, are the result of descending dribbles. Subjects, subjectless painting was Whistler's way of challenging the corrupt, in his view, aesthetic of Victorian narrative painting and French academic art. The function of titles like Symphony in White and Harmony in Grey and Gold was to divert viewers from an imaginative involvement with the figures, dispelling any story from forming around them. 
people had acquired the habit of looking through pictures, whereas Whistler contended that the proper way to experience a work of art was to look at it, observing the general effect, assessing whether or not the picture formed a perfectly integrated and harmonious whole. Black was wanted on that spot. It's a nice coincidence for our purposes that there is a painting by Kandinsky called The Black Spot. More consequentially, more significantly, 40 years after Whistler, Kandinsky also began giving his paintings quasi-musical titles, and he began to do this several years before his paintings became well and truly abstract. The Russian art historian Nadia Bodzemskaya has commented on Kandinsky's strategy in choosing such titles, and her commentary is equally pertinent to Whistler. Such titles, she wrote, permitted the painting's true content, to which the titles alluded, to be dissociated from the object of representation and from the literary subject. It might be said that this dissociation between figurative work and abstract title, or between abstract work and a figurative title, would become a constant source of creativity in the 20th century, as indeed has been the case. The crux of Whistler's polemic, therefore, was his insistence that paintings were meant to be looked at, not through. In landscape painting in particular, the conventions favoured an illusion of transparency and deep space. But Whistler's painting, in an exact parallel with the French Impressionists, stood as an exception to the rule because of their negation of spatial depth and affirmation of the materiality of the painted surface. Over time, Whistler developed ways of impeding a viewer from looking through a picture. He thickened the atmosphere of his landscapes with fog and mist, and he brought on the night. The first of Whistler's night paintings, and this is presumed to be uh, the very first, uh, were painted during his a trip he made to Valparaiso in Chile in 1866. This genre of his paintings was initially called Moonlights, but after 1872, they were collectively known as Nocturnes. Whistler's strategy of deliberate obfuscation was in every sense of the word dimly viewed by the art establishment. And incidentally, how perfect uh, the coincidence that the harmony in golden black, which we looked at earlier, belongs to Harvard University, uh, to the Fog Museum. Paintings like this portray equival equivocal phenomena situated on the brink of appearance and disappearance. The motif has been scrubbed back to a bare minimum of visible technique, of substance, and of demonstrable skill. Whistler talked of breadth and simplicity and broader 
and emptier sketches. His admirer and disciple, Mortimer, Mortimer Mentz, remembered. Reducing, refining, emptying. Whistler produced some of the most provocatively reductive works of the 19th century. And this is one of them. Nocturne in the Philadelphia Museum of Art is uh, an amazing thing painted sometime between 1875 and 1880. The disappearing act that Whistler stages virtually extinguishing the subject, the motif, the scene, he described as a process of abstraction. Yet the end result of the process wasn't nothing. It wasn't without meaning and value. Here's what he said. As the light fades and the shadows deepen, all petty and exacting details vanish. Everything trivial disappears. And I see things as they are in great, strong masses. The buttons are lost, but the garment remains. The garment is lost, but the sitter remains. The sitter is lost, but the picture remains. But the picture remains. Whistler's contemporaries were hard to convince that this was the case. Pictures in darkness are contradictions in terms, fulminated the critic of the London uh, periodical Literary World. The doyen of British art critics, John Ruskin, was drawn into the controversy probably because of his possessive relationship towards Turner's posterity. Here in Whistler was seemingly an upstart painter attempting uh, one-upmanship uh, of uh, Turner's atmospherics uh, pro or producing an easy parody thereof. At any rate, uh, Ruskin couldn't contain his rage when he saw Whistler's Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Falling Rocket, in a commercial gallery in London, uh, noticing that it had a price tag of 200 guineas. He launched an all-out attack on Whistler. I have seen and heard so much cockney impudence before now, but never expected to hear a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. According to Théodore Duré, the controversy around Whistler's Nocturnes ruined the prospect of him making sufficient sales and delayed public acceptance of his paintings for many years. The Falling Rocket, in fact, only found a buyer in 1892, 17 years after it had been painted, 15 years after Ruskin's public savaging of it. The gathering of people in Fantin Latour's homage to Delacroix has been a sort of primal scene for the purposes of this lecture, and I have to return to it one more time because we need to acknowledge the link, uh, the very important link, between Whistler and Charles Baudelaire. Whistler's ideas of color music were anticipated by Baudelaire long, long before those ideas gained currency in the visual arts. 
Baudelaire aired his ideas in 1846, a full 17 years before Fantin Latour painted his homage to Delacroix, 21 years before Whistler began giving his paintings musical titles, and 66 years before 1912, the year when abstract paintings were first exhibited to a substantial public in a couple of European capital cities. Baudelaire's proposal would have come as a bolt from the blue in 1846. Here is what he wrote. Harmony is the basis of the theory of color. Melody is unity in color. It is the general coloration. Melody requires a conclusion. It is an ensemble where individual effects work towards a general effect. Melody makes a profound impression on the faculty of memory. Most of our young colorists lack a feeling for melody. The best way of ascertaining whether a picture is melodious is to see it from a sufficient distance so that you cannot grasp the subject nor see the contour lines. If the picture is melodious, it will already make sense and will already constitute a memorable experience. It's as if Baudelaire foresees 20 years in advance that an artist of Whistler's ilk is going to appear on the contemporary scene. And most extraordinarily of all, his words are the earliest explicit intimations of the possibility of non-objective painting. The earliest that anyone has been able to find. And so, given the benefit of hindsight, it's not so surprising uh, anymore to discern in the naturalist school uh, that was uh, revealed in the Salon des Refusés the seeds of what would uh, rapidly develop uh, in the direction of abstract art. The intelligent reappraisal of a great painting like this one, which is by Peter de Hoog, uh, was because people were able to see it afresh, both as a quasi photograph of a contemporary scene and as a pictorial composition which had been worked through with the utmost rigor, where the colors, tones, shapes, proportions, and intervals interact with each other on the surface of the painting as well as in depth. As the art historian Georges Roch put it in a book published in 2003, book is called What is Abstract Art? The first battle of abstract art was to gain recognition that there were works in existence whose abstract elements prevailed over their iconic elements. Whose abstract elements prevailed over their iconic elements. That puts Whistler and his struggles where they belong, historically, on the front line, in the avant-garde, and it serves to locate Baudelaire as a unique prophet and visionary of the modern art that was to come. Whistler, Degas, and Fantin Latour, according to Degas, had all started out together, so to speak, on the road from Holland. 
whereas Pete Mondrian, 50 years on, came upon the modern art scene quite literally on the road from Holland. And he had something truly wonderful uh, to say uh, about figurative painters. Peter de Hoog is a great exemplar of what Mondrian had to say, just how respectful and attentive these artists were uh, to the intrinsic beauty of their materials and to the abstract logic of composition. This is what Mondrian wrote. Unconsciously, every true artist has always been moved by the beauty of line, color, and relationships for their own sake and not by what they represent. Consciously, the artist has followed the forms of objects. Consciously, he has tried to express things and sensations through modeling and technique. But unconsciously, he has established planes. You'll notice that de Hoog has contrived here a planar composition. He has augmented the tension of line and purified the color. In, in de Hoog, uh, the you'll see the purified red, yellow, and blue, and this <clears throat> very considered uh, play of white and black, uh, along with the gradations of gray. Thus, gradually, through the centuries, the culture of painting has led to the total abolition of the limiting form and particular representation. In our time, art has been liberated from everything that presents it from being truly plastic. Mondrian wrote that in 1942. We've uh, just about run out of time. <clears throat> I did want to end with a coda to this lecture, uh, looking at the stimulating effect Whistler's painting had had on various artists who are important to our s story of the 50 years that changed painting. Artists such as Monet, Seurat, Matisse, Picasso, Kandinsky, and Mondrian. Uh, Whistler had uh, an impact on them all, though I think uh, people have grown uh, largely unaware of how important and influential an artist Whistler actually was. Uh, but I wouldn't want to omit the large role Whistler played as an inspiration to the so-called Australian Impressionists. Whistler had a follower, a pupil, a disciple, I'm not sure how to categorize the relationship, with Mortimer Mentz, who'd grown up in Adelaide and had migrated with his family to London at the age of 20. Never returning to Australia, eventually assimilating thoroughly into British high society. Mems met, met with Whistler in 1880 and fell under his spell. Since Mems has never uh, been claimed back by Australian art historians, uh, I will uh, take the liberty of uh, moving uh, along. That's a photograph of Mentz and Whistler. On the other hand, Tom Roberts had studied uh, at the uh, National Gallery School in Melbourne and uh, became aware of Whistler's work uh, on a trip to uh, Europe. On a screen, a picture of Whistler and uh, on the right, 
uh, a, a painting which shows uh, how was this ideas extended to uh, a, a, a type of aesthetic decor which became highly influential. Uh, this ambience of aestheticism uh, affected Tom Roberts uh, and uh, was a, uh, an enthusiasm he brought back to Australia. Roberts had studied at the National Gallery School in Melbourne with Eugen von Gerard, and between 1881 and 1885, he was in Europe, uh, evidently uh, traveling wide, widely and uh, completing his education. Whether or not he was able to make contact with Mortimer Mems in London, whether or not he ever had direct con contact with Whistler, we don't know. Uh, we do think it more than probable, if not definite, that when Roberts was in London in 1884, he was able to see an exhibition of Whistler's work at Dowdswell's Gallery in New Bond Street. As usual, Whistler exhibited not just his handiwork, uh, but put forward his didactic aims. He undertook the decoration of the gallery himself and oversaw the installation. Uh, the gallery walls were painted flesh color, which I assume is dusty pink, uh, with gray and white. The effect, viewers thought, was very pleasing. The exhibition title proclaimed that the paintings were notes, harmonies, nocturnes. Harmonies, we know what he meant by that term. Nocturnes, his most controversial and reviled pictures. Notes, what were notes? Here in the reserves of the Freer Gallery in Washington, D.C., you see some examples. Very small watercolors and oil sketches, almost all of them uh, painted en plein air. And when they were uh, exhibited at Dowd's Wills, they were all framed, expensively framed, made into precious little objects. This is a small painting Tom Roberts painted in London in 1884, which would have to be the earliest extant response by an Australian artist to Whistler, if we rule out Mentz as an Australian. Three years after his return to Australia, Roberts painted an autumn morning Milson's Point, which is a Whistlerian symphony or harmony in metallic colors. The bronze of the sky, uh, Sydney Siders would uh, rapidly uh, associate with raging bushfires. But the artist is lost in the enchantment of the weird and wonderful alchemy of light and color. Enthusiasm for Whistler and his ideas uh, spread among Roberts' contemporaries here in particular to his most gifted contemporary from the National Gallery School, Charles Condor. Two Condors also painted in Sydney. In 1889, Roberts, Condor and Arthur Streeton held an exhibition of conspicuously Whistlerian notes called the 9 by 5 Impression Exhibition. It consisted of 182 small oil sketches. Here's a delectable little condor painted at Bronte Beach in Sydney with a magical glint of green in the breaking waves. Narrative, anecdotage, subject matter, sentiment remained e eagerly sought by the art public in Australia as much as anywhere else. 
and Whistler's attempt to persuade the public that paintings were things that you looked at rather than into and through met with great resistance. It's a resistance that never really went away, if the truth be told. Frederick McCubbin on the left, Charles Condor on the right, both produced what are essentially subjectless paintings of a character characteristically Whistlerian type, despite the fact that subjectless paintings were very obviously not what the art fanciers in Sydney and Melbourne desired. And so McCubbin and Condor provided titles that gave these paintings an anecdotal spin. McCubbin called his painting on the left Lost. Condor called his painting on the right How We Lost Poor Flossie. And yes, there's another fable of modern art in that. How We Lost Poor Flossie. Thank you for your interest. See you again.